This video was produced for Newcastle Disability Forum's No Steps History Walks project, funded by the People's Health Trust using money raised by the Health Lottery, North East and Cumbria. In February 1820, a group of men met in central London with one clear aim – to kill the entire cabinet and thus bring about a revolution. Led by a Lancashire farmer's son called Arthur Thistlewood, the conspirators had amassed a fearsome array of muskets, cutlasses and pikes. The idea was to burst into a cabinet meeting, chop the heads off much-hated Tory ministers and mount those heads on pikes on Westminster Bridge. The rebels then intended to seize control of London's arsenals, use artillery to destroy various buildings, including the Bank of England, and pretty much bring down the entire state. This was the Cato Street Conspiracy. It's a minor footnote in history because it failed. At least two of the conspirators were government agents. The entire cabinet was not meeting that night, they'd been tipped off. All those involved were captured. Most were hanged or transported. It was the closest this country has come to a full-on French-style revolution. But what often goes unremarked by historians is why the Cato Street group formed in the first place. Because the conspiracy would never have happened if it weren't for a fiery radical thinker from Tyneside that few people have heard of, Thomas Spence. Thomas Spence was born in the Quayside area of Newcastle in 1750, the son of Scottish migrants and one of 19 children. His father was a poor net maker, his mother sold stockings. Thomas grew up to be sickly and undernourished. As a man, he was about five feet tall. He also had a limp and a speech impediment. But if his body was underdeveloped, his brain was not. He was a voracious reader and a thinker. Because his family were Presbyterians, they placed emphasis on literacy so they could read scripture. Spence became a schoolmaster in his late teens first at the Free Grammar School in Hayden Bridge, then at Sandgate Chapel School on the Quayside. In 1781 he married a Miss Elliot, and they had a son, William. Spence might never have troubled the world of politics, if it hadn't been for a local dispute I've mentioned already in this series. In 1771, the town moor was threatened with enclosure by Newcastle Corporation. Spencer's friend and mentor, the preacher, John Murray, was bitterly opposed to taking common land from the freemen, and Spence seems to have been radicalised by the successful battle. He became fixated on the idea that land should be held in common by the people, and that everyone should have the vote. Spence's ideas can be summed up as follows. The aristocracy stole the land from the people, and so they should be abolished along with the monarchy. Every man and woman should have the vote and elect local leaders. Each parish should own the land and rent it out using the revenue to help the poor. And in a remarkable example of prescience, he insisted that children, too, should have rights enshrined in law, a unique idea in England at that time. In 1775, Thomas Spence presented his ideas to a meeting of the fledgling Literary and Philosophical Society. His talk was entitled The Real Rights of Man. It didn't go down well with the prosperous gentlemen who heard it, at their next meeting, they voted to expel him. Spence also tried to promote his ideas by writing books. One, Crusonia, was penned as a sequel to Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe, which, as you may recall, was probably written on Tyneside. The second novel, Spensonia, was more original, but both were depictions of democratic utopias based on the author's ideas. At around this time, Spence also became friends with Jack the Blaster, the eccentric who created Marsden Grotto as a way of avoiding paying rent to a landlord. On the wall of the grotto, Spence wrote the following. Ye landlords vile, whose man's peace ma, come levy rents here if you can. Your stewards and lawyers I defy, and live with all the rights of man. By 1788, Thomas Spence had become such a notorious radical that he lost his teaching job at Sandgate, and at the same time, his marriage broke down. He decided to go all in for radical politics and moved to London. He became a bookseller and pamphleteer, spreading his ideas for land and voting reform among the poor. He also promoted education and came up with a plan to reform the alphabet because he felt the confusing, 
messy nature of English spelling was a way for the ruling classes to deny knowledge, and therefore power, to ordinary people. Much of Spencer's work was published in both regular English and what he called Spensonian. Not surprisingly, Spence came to the attention of the authorities. The French Revolution was in full swing, and in 1792 Spence was arrested for seditious libel, a catch-all term meaning that he criticised the government. He was jailed for a short time. He was arrested again two years later, charged with high treason, and spent seven months in jail, but was never actually convicted. The government had suspended habeas corpus, which meant it could imprison anyone it liked without trial. Despite this persecution, Spence's influence grew. His followers took to chalking up graffiti at night, such as Spencer's Plan and Full Bellies and The Land is the People's Farm. Further arrests followed, and in 1801 he served a year on another count of seditious libel. In a pamphlet, he had stated he would not fight the French if they invaded. His reasons were given in typical forthright fashion. What must I say to the French if they come, if they jeeringly ask me what I'm fighting for? Must I tell them, for my country, my dear country in which I dare not pluck a nut? Would they not laugh at me? If the French came, I would throw down my musket, saying, let such as the Duke of Portland, who claims the country, fight for it. The Duke of Portland was the Home Secretary at the time. William Cobbett, a radical MP who championed the cause of the poor, was present at Spencer's trial in 1801. Many years later, Cobbett wrote, He had no counsel but defended himself and insisted that his views were pure and benevolent, in proof of which, in spite of all exhortations to the contrary, he read his pamphlet through. He was found guilty and sentenced to be imprisoned for I forget how long, he was a plain, unaffected, inoffensive-looking creature. He did not seem at all afraid of any punishment, and appeared much more anxious about the success of his plan than about the preservation of his life. After he came out of prison, he pursued the inculcation of his plan, appearing to have no other care. And this he did, I am assured, to the day of his death, always having been a most virtuous and inoffensive man, and always very much beloved by those who knew him. After Spence died, in 1814, his followers founded a movement called the Spencian Philanthropists, based around clubs of like-minded radicals dotted around the country. In 1817, the government made all such clubs illegal. In 1819, the Spencians were among the many democratic groups that gathered in St. Peter's Fields in Manchester for a peaceful demonstration against high food prices and to demand parliamentary reform. Magistrates ordered cavalry to attack the crowd of 60,000 people, killing 18 and injuring hundreds. It became known as the Peterloo Massacre, a bitterly ironic reference to the great victory at Waterloo. The government's response was not to ease up, but to introduce new restrictions on personal freedom. Newspapers were suppressed, journalists were jailed. Magistrates now had the right to search all private property for firearms. Any kind of weapons training by ordinary citizens was outlawed. Bail was restricted, and punishments for seditious libel, that handy catch-all term, were made more severe. There were rumblings of rebellion almost everywhere. It was against this background that the Spencians decided to act. While Thomas Spence had never explicitly called for violence in his writings, his followers now felt they had no choice. Their leader, Arthur Thistlewood, had already tried to incite rebellion and been involved in food riots. In 1817, he was jailed for challenging the Home Secretary, Lord Sidmouth, to a duel. The term hothead was never more applicable. Thistlewood's plan was to kill the cabinet and set up a revolutionary government in London's mansion house. The idea was to trigger a popular uprising, as the conspirators only numbered a few dozen. Many working-class radicals, such as London's Irish community and various trade guilds, apparently backed the Spencians but the plotters had already been betrayed by government agents. One, George Edwards, actually provided them with pistols and hand grenades and urged them to assassinate the cabinet. On the evening of the 22nd of February, 1820, the conspirators gathered at a loft in the Marylebone area, expecting to start a revolution, only to be confronted by a magistrate and armed Bow Street runners. Some surrendered peacefully, but Thistlewood killed an officer in a sword fight before being captured. Thistlewood 
and four other conspirators were hanged and then decapitated at Newgate Prison on the 1st of May, 1820. Others were transported for life. It was a sad end to the idealism that had motivated Thomas Spence for so many years. But later, as campaigns for reform evolved into the Chartist movement, his influence would be felt again. He was the first to use the term the rights of man, later popularised by the much more famous Thomas Paine. He was the first to insist that children should also have rights, and his belief that women should have the vote put him over a century ahead of his contemporaries. In 2015, an international conference on Spence was held in the city of Toulouse. Almost forgotten in the northeast, Spence is still provoking debate on the world stage. Let's end with the man's own words. Awake, arise, arm yourselves with truth, justice, reason. Lay siege to corruption. Claim as your inalienable right universal suffrage and annual parliaments. And whenever you have the gratification to choose a representative, let him be from among the lower orders of men, and he will know how to sympathise with you. <laughs>